Good afternoon, everyone. On the behalf of Team Data Channel Online, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you on the second virtual World Implant Expo 2021. I'm Dr. Aditi Mishra, and I'll be the host for today's session on the topic, The Modus of Randy of Bone Building in Clinical Implantology by Dr. Himadri Chakravarti. So before starting the session, I have a few housekeeping notes to make. If you have any doubts during the session, you can put your questions in the question and answer box and each and every question will be taken up at the end of the session. If you have joined us from Facebook and YouTube Live, you can ask us questions by commenting and we'll be answering them at the end of the session. So without further ado, I, I would like to introduce our today's speaker to everyone. Dr. Himadri Chakravarti is the Professor of Periodontics in Guru Nanak Institute of Dental Sciences and Research. And he has completed his Master's in Periodontics in the year 2003 from R. Ahmed Dental College and Hospital Kolkata. Since then, his focus was concentrated on strict clinical practice of periodontics and implantology. He, he is trained in several implant systems, started his implantology training as a certified implantologist from MA Rangoonwala College of Dental Sciences and Research Center, Pune, in the year 2004. He continued to be upgraded in implant training under Dr. R.C. Hertel at JVD Wanderlin, Netherlands. In the year 2006, he has completed his training in single piece, both mini and conventional compression screw immediate loading implant system. In the same year, he got his training in more staple hexagon system from Florence, Italy. Over to you, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so, could I share the screen, Aditi? Yes, sir. Okay. So, just let me know if you can see my screen. Is it okay? Yes, sir. It's there. Okay. So, good afternoon, friends. Uh, uh, at the outset, I would uh, apologize for the fact that I had this lecture day for yesterday, but I was not very well. That's why I have uh, postponed this for today. So what we, I have uh, talking about the modus operandi of bone building in clinical implantology because we have a limited period of time. Mostly I'm going to talk about, uh, except the sinus elevation, what are the other methods of bone building, like uh, rich preservation, some horizontal GBRs, little bit of vertical GBR, as well as uh, ridge split technique. So these are the four techniques I'm going to discuss vertical because we don't have too much of an option for vertical because of the limitation of time so we will limit our discussion about vertical implants vertical uh, gbr the rest of these things we will discuss in a little bit of detail most of these um, presentation is based on cases so case to case i will discuss and probably uh, i will talk about the intermediate technique uh, in between the cases okay uh, so, um, hope that uh, for next 45 minutes, 50 minutes, we're going to have fun time. So, a GBR, uh, uh, now, when you talk about predictable bone regeneration in everyday clinical applications, uh, mostly in terms of implantology, you talk about GBR. And uh, GBR is uh, mostly uh, divided into two broad divisions. Of course, you, all of us have known about the rich preservation, uh, which is uh, one site and multiple adjacent site, infected site, and and posterior sites, whatever it may be. Rich preservation is where we are extracting the tooth, but we cannot place immediate implants, and we are trying to preserve the contour and the volume of the ridge. And uh, the second one is the case is already having extraction history of extraction, and the bone volume and bone dimension is collapsed. So we need to augment that either horizontally or vertical. And um, that's why the talk techniques we're going to talk about. Now, when you talk about GBR versus GTR, the differentiating point is in GTR, we build all the periodontal tissues because we have the tooth into the place. And so we build bone, we build uh, parental ligament, we build uh, cementum, at least we try to do. And, but in GBR, the, the thing that we want to build is only hard tissue okay now if we need to build the soft tissue simultaneously we need to do the soft tissue procedure which is uh, not the parts and parcel of today's discussion for, on my presentation 
we are going to talk about only bone building. Okay. Now, different kind of uh, biomaterials we have for this. We have uh, different kind of uh, cortical cancellous material uh, like uh, uh, xenografts. We have um, alloplasts. We have uh, allografts. And we have different kind of membrane as well in terms of uh, uh, coverage. In like um, uh, either it, it is a it is a carjal membrane or it's a uh, it can be broadly divided into uh, your resolvable and non-resolvable membranes. But most of the times nowadays, unless it's a very big um, uh, volume augmentation, we don't do uh, non-resolvable membranes. Mostly it's resolvable membranes. So we will give, we're going to discuss about all these things a little bit more because I'm not going to go into the detail of the theory this too much, but I want to show you more and more number of cases. So guided bone regeneration, why it is required? Because many a times, even if there is no bone, you know, you will find that there's a place for placement of implants. Yeah, you can, okay, but that will be more surgically driven placement of implants. And when you will make the crowns or the prosthesis, because we know that uh, implantology is basically a, a prosthetically driven science, we will be having trouble. So most of the times to place the implant in right prosthetic position, we might land up to a situation where we need to regenerate the body. So restoratively driven implant placement frequently necessitates development of adequate volume of bone because if you, if you want to place the implant in best bone, probably you don't require the uh, placement of bone grafts or volume augmentation. Unfortunately, placing the bone in the best bone doesn't give you the best position in terms of the crowns of the bridges. So to give the best position in terms of restorative uh, position of the future crown and the bridges, prosthetic position of the crown and the bridges, you require to place the implant in the right place. And most of the times you find the resorption pattern of the ridges are such where extraction has been done previously that to place the implant in right prosthetic position, you will have uh, deficiencies of bone. So you need to augment those cases. And that's why GBR is so much important because in last 30, 40 years, we have been able to understand that placing implant in native bone always doesn't give you the best outcome. So we understand that placing the implant in right prosthetic position is more important than placing the implant in anywhere bone. So, so that is very important. And with the predictable techniques of uh, GBR that has been evaluated in the last 25, 30 years, now we are in a position to place place uh, implants and to build bone around it. So that's, that's the whole essence of my discussion today. So as I've already talked about, the GBR uses the principles of GTR for implant science development. And where, wherever GTR requires uh, regeneration of bone, PDL, and cementum to form new periodontal apparatus, the requirements of implant site development is less complicated uh, because it requires only formation of bone. And GBR uses the barrier concept of selectively permeating osteoporogenitis cells and eliminating uh, your your epithelial cells to colonize the site and so that you will have only incremented bone volume and nothing else. Now, before uh, starting my cases to show about uh, showcase, let's try to think about that what principles GBR is actually working on. Because if you, if you, if you see that GTR works with the principle of Melker's hypothesis, which has been hypothesized way back in 1976, but GBR today, what we are talking about is mostly dependent on our principle called past principle. The past principle has been this coinage and this technique has been elaborated and discussed by these two guys called, one guy is from India, uh, Lakshmi Bhayapati, and another one is Homle Wong in 2006. And what price past principle talks about, it, it calls past means P-A-S-S. -S. P is primary stability of the wounds, angiogenesis, and um, primary closure of the wounds, stability of the wounds, and space maintenance. So these are four principles. Primary closure, uh, and uh, then you come with angiogenesis, then stability of the wound, and uh, space maintenance. So these are the four characteristic 
that has to be maintained. So you can understand the primary closure has to be absolutely fantastic. It has to be almost watertight. So for that, you need to find out some principles. I will talk about that. Then, because if you have done a completely uh, nice primary closure and you have segregated the chamber from outside, so you have angiogenesis, new formation of new blood vessels. And if you can maintain the space and if you can stabilize them, because you know, for any wound healing, stability is very, very important. If there is a movement of the wound, uh, the healing gets hampered. So if you can stabilize the wound, if you can maintain the space and there will be new angiogenesis and, uh, you know, uh, there will be uh, formation of burn. So this past principle is most important, not the military hypothesis in case of GBR. So the first set of case we're going to talk about is loose preservation. Means you have extracted the tooth, but you have not been able to place the simultaneous implant. But <clears throat> previously, if you had, uh, if you had a missing anterior tooth, uh, missing anterior tooth and most of, most of the time, even for posteriors, you didn't have the buccal bone, we couldn't have preserved the region at the point of time. It's very, very difficult. We can, if it's a small, uh, small fenestration, we can do some technique like ice cream cone techniques or uh, other techniques. But uh, if you have got a, uh, you know, it, if, if, it is a, if it is an infected site, there's a loss of complete buccal plate, it was very, very difficult to do a root preservation. But now we have techniques like um, uh, vestibular socket therapy by, by uh, Elascari. Uh, there are techniques by which you can do risk preservation in those situations as well. So we are going to talk, discuss about this conventional risk preservations where we have all the walls intact, but you cannot place the implant simultaneously. So in that situation, this is the first case. So the first principle that we have to uh, work upon is minimally traumatic extraction. If you do a very mutilated extraction, uh, you, you, you lose the wall and your main purpose of doing the rich preservation is completely out of question. So first thing is minimally preserving traumatic extraction. So we can see that uh, it's a premolar site, but you've seen that on the right side, the amount of preservation and the minimal trauma you have created, still we have kept the septum, okay? So that is, but keeping the septum is not mandatory, but what I wanted to show you the amount of trauma that has been given is so minimal that even the septum is intact, okay? So first, uh, you know, uh, first principle is minimally traumatic extraction. So the principles are number one, do not reflect the interdental papilla, especially in the aesthetic zone, and moreover, not even the flap. If you have to do a flap, do a very, very minimalistic mini flaps, but Please keep the interdental papilla intact because, uh, you know, if you, if you extract this tooth, most of the times you will find that the extraction uh, and the, the flap, your papilla goes off. So if you raise the papilla, it's completely gone. Now we have techniques like uh, uh, socket shield techniques or modified socket shield techniques by the blocker, where we can keep part of the tooth and we wait for some period of time. Most of the times we don't require to do ridge augmentation so it's uh, bone volume because most of the times there is formation of bone uh, and there is no collapse of the buccal ridge because you have kept a kind of a shape. But that's a part of a discussion, we're not discussing here. So number one is focus the control on the process of tooth removal. The use of thin elevation, most of the times we use the periotone to do the trauma of the bone. We have got a control luxation and a very controlled force, or even for the molars, we need to section the tooth to prevent the bone loss. So we section the tooth and we extract the tooth root individually. And uh, all the soft tissue fragments on uh, any kind of pathology if you have has to be completely eliminated. So we need to do a nice uh, use the curate very well. We need to do a lot of irrigation with normal saline. That's you don't require special um, irrigant for that. No antibacterial is required. Now it has been shown by the studies that even normal saline can do the job. So, but you require a lot of volume to flush any kind of uh, any kind of residual tissue. Okay. So uh, the problem we have that uh, predictable bone regeneration in every clinical practice uh, it gets hindered. Now you can see that uh, the Labial mean thickness of uh, the bone, especially in, 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 in cervical area, is uh, 
uh, around 0.92 millimeter. Now, this is mostly in the posteriors. Unfortunately, in anteriors, you will not get even 0 0.5, 0 0.6 millimeter above. And most of the time, we, even with best of your extraction, if you, if you have a periapical pathology, you'll find there is a hole or a dehiscence, uh, sorry, a fenestration like this. So in that situation, uh, probably you need, might need to do a little bit of flap elevation, or you might need to do a little bit of uh, aesthetic buccal flap. And you can see in the posterior bone volume is still good. Like if you have, uh, uh, this is a study uh, where you can see that the posterior alveolar bone cervical is around 0.9. Mid root is around 0.98, but more epically you go, we have got a half bar, like 1.5 millimeter above. But in case of uh, anteriors, unfortunately, especially in the canine to canine region in the upper anteriors, in the aesthetic zone where our labial bone volume is very, very less, it's around 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So once you extract, this bone belongs to the tooth. Okay. So it is not body's bone to be very fine. It starts collapsing. So we need to maintain the volume of the socket. So this preservation is very, very important. Now, <clears throat> let's see some studies. Uh, very uh, famous studies from Arao, Sprop, and Niazela. Arao in 2009, you, you can see there is a mean bone loss of 2.5 millimeter, which is huge, or 35% of the alveolar bone weight in first six months of post-extraction. So if you have extracted, uh, 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 it's tooth where your original dimension was nine millimeter, okay, buccolingual dimension. So you lose around three millimeters of burn, more than three millimeters of burn, three and a half millimeters of burn. Uh, so it becomes six millimeter in the next six months. That's for the posterior. For anteriors, it's it's horrible. Anteriors, if you see this study by crop, he has done mostly into the anteriors. Uh, this study has been published in Niger PRD. There is a, in one to three months, you lose almost 50% of the bone, uh, almost two thirds of the socket is gone. So if your original reach for uh, a central incisor for, or for a canine or for a lateral incisor was seven millimeter, you are now landed up to 3.5 mm. Okay, that's why there's people who are talking mostly about immediate placements, uh, talking about socket shield techniques, because you can see it's a huge amount of bone volume loss according to the study based crop. Now let's see, see this study, uh, which is published by Yazela in JP 2003. It is saying that not treating the alveolus at the time of extraction resulted in a loss of 29%, 30% bone volume. So if you treat the socket, means if you try to preserve the socket by materials, by materials, you can preserve loss of 30% bone volume of the origin if you, if you attempt it. So every time we, we, we should try it if it is feasible, okay? If it is feasible biologically, if it is feasible uh, financially, and it is very, very important. Even if you're not placing the implant, it's very, very important that in future cases where you are placing, uh, doing even a bridge, preservation of ridge is very, very important. The gracious resorption occurred in the buccal plate because I told you that the palatal plate of the lingual side gets enough nutrition, but buccal plate is away from the nutrition, so it collapses. And maxillary alveolar loss is more weak than the mandibular alveolar loss. So maxillary, especially in the aesthetic zone, there is a huge loss. So, so let's see a study of the fate of the buccal wall, the extraction socket of the teeth with prominent roots. Sorry. Uh, that we have examined 36 maxillary teeth, and we have found that in 90 day CT scan, there is a loss of 79% uh, of the sites lost less than 20% buccal weight, and 71% sites lost more than 20% buccal weight. So, buccal plate loss is very, very, uh, this is a study by Maron Nevins, and in, uh, you know, uh, Human mineralized bone in extraction site in implant placement in molars. We can see the healing of bone grafts in four months. Single red healing of bone grafts in four months. The crystal bone located coronal to first one fade. No gingival recession was observed. So soft tissue maintained its level, but you know, 
the the even if we place the implants not deep enough, we will lose bone. So that is very very important. So the change in the alveolar dimension of upper extraction is reduce eliminated possibility of implant placement and prostatically driven ideal position if we are not doing a lot of uh, if we are not trying to preserve the bone. Okay. So this is a very interesting study by Yuma Darby and Stephen Chin or uh, Danny Boozer from uh, the ITA group, uh, which has been published in 2009. And um, they have done basically it's a uh, rich preservation techniques and you can see it's a um, it, it's basically a systemic uh, randomized clinical trials has been it's a, it's a, it's a uh, controlled trial that has been accumulated to get together to do this uh, systematic approach of the study and they have done it's not a meta-analysis but it's a it's a, it's a systematic uh, approach and they have found that uh, despite the heterogeneous of study it was concluded that rich preservation procedures are affecting in limiting horizontal and vertical radial operation in posterior extraction site and there is no evidence to support the support of one technique or other so there are several techniques but almost all of them give equal to prevent results and there is no conclusive evidence that this preservation procedure improved the ability of, to place the implants mostly into the anteriors. Okay. So when you conclude about the study that uh, angular preservation is effective, uh, limiting horizontal and uh, vertical reach regeneration technique, and you don't have any conclusive evidence that which preservation procedures improve the ability to place implant, but maintenance of the volume of the reach still remains. So what we do in these cases most of the times we extract and either we use particulate graft along with some bit of biologics like uh, prf or we have uh, collagen already collagen sponges which are already loaded with uh, bone graft materials from different companies and we can tuck them in so histological analysis is the healing after tooth extraction with rich preservation using uh, mineralized human bone allograft that is fdba by this uh, by beck and Milley, that is published you can see that uh, vital new bone is it, it's a huge uh, uh, percentage of science and changes as i mentioned bone loss is very very minimal if we uh, see that minimal bone loss has happened 0.37 in uh, percentage and uh, uh, we can understand that the placement of uh, uh, histomorphic analysis say that the, the risk preservation is a very, very important and a very useful technique because we use very less amount of bone. So the idea is uh, uh, we, we are normally, if we are using materials which are collagen loaded with bone materials, we can just tuck it in and leave it. Otherwise, we pack this so gently, not very compaction, with not very much compaction. Gently, we pack these uh, sockets with uh, after thorough curatage uh, with the material, and then we use uh, uh, you know a membrane on the top. Now, here most of the times we use uh, open membrane technique because you cannot close it because don't try to close, especially because in that case you need to release the flap we don't do it so this is the way we fill the socket and then we give a cross mattress feature to hold this and it tells the patient to maintain with thorax in and rings and uh, many times uh, we can place non reserve membrane as well so afterwards when we do implants we will excise and take out the non reserve membrane maybe after six months or nine months and uh, because sometimes this open membrane healing uh, causes infection, okay? Now, so the patient has to maintain, uh, if the patient is a smoker, we need to instruct the patient to completely stop smoking within this period. And you need to give uh, chlorexin and rings and probably every fourth day you need to call the patient to the office, dental office, and we need to irrigate the place with chlorexin as well. So it will heal with a period of time. And uh, we can see that uh, this is uh, the case that we are talking about. This is after five months, okay? So you can see that after extraction, after we have grafted the site, 
how much bone volume you could maintain. If you have not done this, probably we have we could have seen a situation I'm showing you uh, where probably the ridge would have collapsed like this. Okay, so probably the ridge that uh, we had uh, some bit of uh, uh, collapse would have been seen like this. Okay, so the ridge this ridge is very well present. So you can see that after extraction is molar volume hardly there is any collapse because we have maintained the bridge this is after five months so now you can place the implants without any hassle because there is uh, no and so you can see that how much reason is preserved this is amazing okay so much of buccal bone we have so you can see the buccal bone weight here is around three three and a half two and a half to three millimeters which is great so we can place the implant in perfect position and we can we can uh, we can uh, get nice results out so this is the situation we are talking about uh, another case uh, immediate placement was a difficult one because of the sinus approximation uh, lift was a problem problematic one most of the times we had a little a problem uh, because of uh, infection in the root so we didn't place the implant immediately we have we have uh, thought about maintaining the ridge volume again the same technique we have Utilized, we have uh, secured the roots, uh, the sockets very well, thoroughly and gently. We have uh, irrigated, done a lavage with the saline, and then we have placed some aloe grafts and closed it with a membrane. It's a collagen membrane, it's a uh, Jason membrane, which is pericardium and given uh, cross mattress suture. So uh, then uh, this case that we were talking about this and now you can see that how much bone has been developed and you can see that now this is after two years because this patient we had to keep it this so after two years you can see how much bone is still there very nice bone volume and you can see from the cbct after placement of the implant and loading it how much bone we have across you know so you can see so much of bone volume that has been there if we would not have done this we would have collapsed probably you would have seen a six seven millimeters bone so so we could maintain the bone very well okay so the next case is a, uh, is a series of extractions and uh, we have uh, so many extractions so this is uh, the first molar, second molar, and the third molar, chip. and we have done a risk preservation of the first and the second molar. And this is covered with PRF membrane only, no membrane other than PRF, double layer PRF membrane, uh, a PRF membrane, and we have done a cross stitch. No other membrane has been used yet, only PRF. And we have placed some allographs, and uh, oh, you can see this is after four months almost the socket volume you can see the socket volume that has been there now if you have not done this in four months surely you would have lost this amount of volume for sure so we could maintain so much of the socket volume here and this is uh, very much uh, interesting uh, you can see now it is how much easier for us to place this implant because you have got so much a bone so you can see the socket volume both in terms of vertical uh, dimension as, as well as your uh, your back cooling width as well. So you can see how much bone we have. And uh, now well, you can see that when it opened up, though there is a little loss of bone volume, which was like this, but still we have been able to maintain this much, which is great, isn't it? So you can see that buckley we have, how much they, do you think that this blood is going to fail ever? Very, very difficult because you have around four millimeter of buccal bone, which is great, isn't it? Four millimeter of buccal bone in the molar, second molar, four millimeter of buccal bone. Here in the premolar, because premolar sockets a little bit smaller than the molars, you have around three millimeters of buccal bone. Enough bone volume to maintain this. So it's a placement of implants, uh, and uh, we have got so much of bone volume four years uh, down the line. Okay? So because you have got such a nice bone volume in terms of uh, width as well as height. 
such a nice maintenance of ring because if you have bone you will have nice maintenance of bone as well so this is the last case for risk preservation uh, this, this is this tooth is failing so this is the CCT for this tooth so you can understand placement of uh, implants simultaneously is a little difficult because you don't have too much of a palatal bone here so you can understand there's a fracture underneath okay it's a failed uh, root uh, post okay so this is the situation uh probably today if i would have done uh, because unless i had this loss of bone here i would have done a socket shelf but uh, uh, because you have we have a little bit of loss of bone here we have not done a socket shield here in this case so this is an extraction you can see uh, Probably socket sheet could have been done in this case, but it's a preservation case. So uh, a little bit of flap is raised and uh, it is packed with some allographs. And uh, now one thing is, if you are trying to place the implants all the years, seven months, nine months, allograft is fine. But if you are planning to keep the socket uh, for a longer period of time, uh, mostly we use xenograft in this case. So remember xenograft, uh, they don't uh, resolve very quickly. They're very slow resolving. So, so xenograft remains for a longer period of time. So, if you are trying to place this implant uh, very late, maybe the patient is going abroad or going for a vacation, or you have to extract the tooth for somebody which is pretty young, where you need to keep this socket for two years, place xenograft. Otherwise, if you want faster remodeling, place. Uh, these kind of graphs like allographs and even if you place xenograft i would request that uh, mix 80 20 80 percent xenograft to 20 percent uh, autogenous and then place okay so in this case uh, again open membrane technique has been used uh, collagen membrane and we have uh, tried to push the buccal flap a little bit uh, away and so that we can create a little bit of volume so this is on tier one and uh, you can see that after four months we would still have volume but the only problem is we don't know whether this volume is only with bone or soft tissue or soft tissue because it's an anterior zone so this is after four months so after four months uh, we're still having this amount of tissue so this was a bonded restoration you can see we have same now we have opened it up can you imagine the amount of bone we have this is amazing isn't it this is quite good this is around five and a half millimeter of bone six rather six millimeter of bone here five and a half to six i don't remember the exact value but getting such kind of a bone in anterior region is a bone unless you have we have done this uh, rich preservation unbelievable that after four months we would have got this amount of work now we can place the implant in right prosthetic position and we can go with uh, a screw written prosthesis in this case and see the emergence of this case and this is three years follow-up and the bone level is still intact because we have placed the implant is now nice healthy bone okay so now we'll come to the next part where the patient has come to us with already extracted tooth okay and the bridge volume has already collapsed so so there are two kinds of uh, you know augmentation first one is horizontal you can understand that the original bone volume was probably here it has collapsed down to here so we are we're going to talk about a little bit about the horizontal augmentation and this one is of course the bone volume was here it has gone down to here so this is mostly vertical reorientation we are talking when we talk about you can see here also a fenestration so probably you need to address this as well so first we talk about when you talk about the horizontal bone augmentation in which you are going to talk about classical gvr and really split and then a little bit about the vertical and say why for this session so the first and foremost thing is the flap design very very important thing very much important because many a times you see all over the world that they use fantastic materials, fantastic techniques, but because of inadequate mobility of the flap to get a closure, which is uh, absolutely watertight and absolutely passive, 
there is opening of the flat margin and there is complete wastage and loss of your uh, bone graft and the membrane because you need to seclude the space with passive closure. So the flap design is very, very important. Now, what I have tried to show with this, that we are trying to mobilize the flap because remember, whenever we are going to have these kind of procedures, we need to mobilize the flap enough so that we can go, if we are doing, doing a buckle flap, you know, from the buckle side, it should go almost three to four millimeter, even five millimeters into the palatal side so that when you augment the bone, the flap doesn't get short and the flap gets a passive closure, okay? So for that, we, we need to uh, probably find a, any one of the techniques. One is, first one is called periosteal uh, incision technique, where we need to incise the periosteum uh, from inside the flap. It's full thickness flap. So incise the periosteum with a sharp 15C blade through that, so that you can incise the periosteum, strip the periosteum in a single line so that you can mobilize the flap. Or nowadays we use a technique by Joseph Shukrun called the soft tissue brushing technique, where we take, there's a set of soft tissue brushes available. So we, we, uh, we brush the inside of the periosteum uh, for two reasons. Number one, if it is like, for example, if it is a lower lingual or any other place where there is a muscle, so we can mobilize the muscle and the collagen mesh work of the leukoperiosteum or, or the periosteum we try to, uh, we, we try to, uh, you know, because it's cross-linked, we try to, uh, we try to break the bonding of the cross-link and thereby create a little bit of mobilization to this and so that we can mobilize the flap. But whatever the technique we are going to talk about, we need to mobilize the flap enough because if we cannot mobilize the flap, this is point number one, because remember, we are talking about past principle, we need to get a passive closure. So for a passive closure, we have to have enough mobilized flap, otherwise we will not have a passive closure. It will be an active closure and during healing, when there is shrinkage of the overlying flap, the margin is open, okay? So when GBR is performed, the flap design should ensure generous access to the osseous defect with minimalistic trauma to the soft tissue. So if we have a defect like this, so you need to take the flap at least one to two teeth away from here, and the vertical should be deep enough. We usually give a vertical or a hockey incision here, and we start the horizontal incision a little bit palatally, okay, or for lower, a little bit lingually. So you can see we have done a wide flap here, and the flap should be wide enough to, to mobilize, number one. So if this is a defect, we need to go way beyond to mobilize the flap. The defect, the flap margin should be much, much away from the defect, Number principle number one. Principle number two, if you have raised the flap, to mobilize the flap as, because our original position of the flap was here, okay? But when we put bone graft material, the volume will increase. So the tension of the flap will increase and the flap will come down to this level. So there will be opening of the margin of the flap and the past principle will be violated because there will not be passive closure and water type closure. So you need to mobilize the flap so that we can go up, almost up to here by mobilizing. So for that kind of a mobilization, we need, so if this is our flap, this is a periosteum, we need to give a straight single incision into the periosteum, or we need to brush. Just we need to brush the periosteum like this with brushing instrument. This is available from Shukrun's site and even for Indian sellers. This is called soft tissue brushing instrument, a set of five. We need to brush them well so that we can mobilize the flap and the flap can go here. Though the original position of the flap was here, we have from here, we have incised that the flap should mobilize at least for four to five millimeters in the palatal so that when you volume augment this place, we can mobilize the flap in such a way that when you go for the closure here, it will be watertight, but still passive, okay? And the soft fit is should be minimum, okay? So the flap must be able to completely cover the bone graft and the barrier membrane during the entire healing period. So 
here the periosteal stripping incision has been given like somewhere here now you can see okay how much we have mobilized the flap as i was talking about five millimeters six millimeters into the palate so that here we have given an inside incision with the periosteum so that we can mobilize and go to the palatal side or the lingual side so that we can completely cover and with passive closure we can get a watertight closure during the whole entire period of healing where the flap margin won't open so this is the key first key okay so the first vertical releasing incision is very very important so what is the importance of vertical releasing incision i've talked about that increases the axis of the alveolar bone and don't be miser giving vertical incisions as long as possible into the vestibule more you go towards the vestibule better of course there will be more uh, chances of this bit of more inflammation but better mobilization of the flap will be there so it decreases the tension of the flap and our repositioning of the flap in the original position is our closure and limit the inclusion of non disease sites on the surgical side so the vertical incision is very very important so let's see some cases of horizontal limitation so this is a horizontal range augmentation we have talked about now now we are going to talk about that we have raised the flap so this amount of volume we need to cover okay so you can see that this amount of tissue is a defect so you fill the defect with uh, allograft or here my choice is again if you are doing the implant a little late a choice of 75 25 percent 75 percent of uh xenograft with 25 percent of uh, autogenous graft mixed together along with uh, APRF, uh, IPRF liquid, we put it like a sticky bone, or you can give straight away, you can give some bit of allograft like A, but remember when you are choosing an allograft, make sure that it's an FDBA, not an EFDBA, because this DFDBA is demineralized and it's only a bone morphogenic protein. So it vanishes in no time. So after three months, you will come and see there's complete volume collapse. So DFDBA or DMBM is not the material for volume augmentation. You require to use FDBA or fridge-dried allograft, which is not tumoralized. So you need to require a cortical graft, not a, a cancerous graft, okay? So, uh, so you can see that uh, the volume augmentation case, in this case, uh, how much augmentation you could, you could have done in five months we have done. Remember, for suturing, it is very, very important. We're going to talk about the suture that here you cannot do a suture straight away. So the last suture the will be covered with the vertical because you need to mobilize the tissue. Now, when you mobilize the tissue, the first and the foremost principle is don't close the margin first, okay? Close the margins last. After that, you will close the vertical. So the vertical, so, so you need to suture in layers. So first you put a vertical, when you stabilize the membrane, now, Stabilization of membrane can be done by so many things. I will come to it. After that, your first suture should be a vertical mattress. Okay. So, which will go deep into the vestibule and deep into the palatal side or the lingual side. So that with layering of sutures, you bring down the uh, flat margin more towards the opposing margin. So, so that you can get a passive closure. So, you will do it in layer. So, usually what you do, you first give a vertical release vertical uh, sorry it's a vertical mattress suture followed by a horizontal mattress suture followed by the suture in the margin which is a cross mattress and then crossing covering this vertical incision last because vertical incision the original position of the flap will change because you have released it and you, it, you have gone into the palatal tissue that's for sure so you can see that how much more volume you have been able to drain so this is the original volume okay and now look at the volume. You have almost maintained the same volume in the orange volume. This is fantastic. Okay. So you can see this is a scenario. Uh, this is this is the loss of tissue. You can see. Okay. So this is this amount of bone volume is uh, sorry. This amount of Just a minute, hold on. Yeah, 
So this amount of bone volume is lost. You can see the original position of the tissue. And uh, this is the original position of the tissue. Uh, originally, it was here. Now it has, so this is amount of bone that you have lost, okay? So we need to augment. So you can see you have uh, done something like some holes, okay? So these holes are called wraps. Uh, wraps means for uh, regional accelerated phenomena. Uh, whether it is really necessary, not too much, but many a times you do wraps because to induce a little bit of bleeding here. Okay, so, but when you release the periosteum from this place, when you, during elevation of the flap, you have already done a little bit of wrap here. But if you want more vascularity here, you can do this kind of small holes with round bars uh, of slow speed drills. And uh, we call it wraps, okay, regional accelerated phenomena. So after that, we have placed the dumbbell osteotomy and uh, you can see that this is the amount of bone it required. So we have placed the bone wraps. Now, many a times it happens that we place the membrane first, okay? There's a technique by uh, Howard Glackman called sausage, sausage technique, uh, which is by Isban Arban. And the you can go to YouTube to see the video from Howard Glackman that he has placed a membrane here, tuck the membrane with some bit of uh, screws, and then it has become like a, like a pouch. So it will become like a pouch. So this is this is stabilized because uh, here, like a membrane, if you have, if you place a membrane here, okay. So if if you have placed a membrane here, so what you do, you place four screws: one screw here, one screw here, one screw here, and one screw here. So when you place four screws, okay, or bone tacks this membrane, it becomes like a pouch. So this is like a sausage. Now you can fill this, you can lift and you get a three dimensional space underneath. You can fill this with materials like this. Now, if you have placed the implant, here it is important like this. And if you have got a thread exposure here, okay? Like your thread is exposed from the buccal side. I would recommend that you first place some autogenous bone on the top of the implant. Don't place any, any graft material first, then you place some autogenous bone, and then you place the graft materials. Now, here in this kind of case, either you place autogenous bone or you can, then you can place some bit of allografts like this, or you can use sandwich technique where you first place autogenous bone, and then you can use a 50-50 mix of xenograft with autogenous bone on the top of that. So the first layer is autogenous, then autogenous and uh, xenograft, 50-50 layers. And then probably then you use 100% of, uh, you know, 100% uh, of xenografts. So it's 100% xenograft. Now what happens? I told you that xenograft is a material which doesn't uh, resolve easily. It remains for years. It's very slow resolving material. So if you place the xenograft and 100% zero but without a layer, it will maintain the volume. So inside you will have formation of bone and the xenograft will remain for, because you have given autogenous and autogenous with xenograft. So there'll be high turnover here, but outside because of the slow turnover of the xenograft, this volume will be maintained. So this technique is fantastic, okay? So you, this is the membrane that's what I'm talking about. You place the membrane, place the graft, so you can stabilize the membrane, or you can stabilize. Anyhow, you have to stabilize the membrane, either with screws or tacks, or probably you need to place uh, some bit of, uh, you know, uh, suture materials to stabilize. And then you can see there is absolutely passive closure. There is no active closure. There is no tension in the graft. Okay. So sometimes you can use material like aloderm, but Unless there is a need of soft tissue augmentation simultaneously, I won't recommend allodum to be used here. Okay. So another case. So you can see. So after this case, you can see how much of bone volume we have been able to augment. So from here, now you can see from here, we have been able to grow bone here to here. So this amount, you know, is quite a bit. So 
the implant has been placed and now customizing abutment will be placed and then okay. so from here we have gained this amount of volume so you can see the augmentation so you can see this amount of augmentation have, have been able to get so the next case uh, is a rich picture because we need to wrap it up now first so remember fasting I, I, we have seen that people do rich splits in three millimeter of bone also it doesn't work you require at least five millimeter of bone to do a rich split at least four millimeter but five millimeter is very well because you have two millimeters of uh, the cortical plates on either side two plus two four and one millimeter for the split so this is one case where the bridge width is around five millimeter we are going to do a bridge split in this case nowadays we can use uh, densification bars like densa but in this case we have done a bridge split because it's a uh, ridge augmentation uh, seminar so i'm talking about the ridge split so you can see it's five millimeter okay so one two three four five five millimeter of bridge width and uh, we'll be so we need to do a split here okay so we'll do it so here is a split that has been done this is a piezo i use in this case so advantage of piezo being because there are the cutters also the only risk is if you cannot stabilize the cutter the, the key of using a cutter is please first take a small round bar put a straight dent in otherwise dent here otherwise if you are using a cutter if you slip it's a risk it, it might go into the soft tissue and there will be a horrible hurricane. So if you want to use a board cutter like uh, from different kit, uh, split kit like SH kit, so you can use a cutter. I don't prefer cutter because I have less control. And moreover, the cutters don't give you too much of a depth. You require quite a bit of depth, like eight millimeter, nine millimeter depth. Cutter doesn't give you more than five millimeter depth. So I don't prefer cutters. But if you are doing it with a cutter, please make a small straight indentations with a round bar so that you can engage your cutter, it doesn't slip, and then do it. Usually I prefer to do it with piezo. I take my piezo bone cutter, I put the depth mark in it, and go to this. You need to go for maxillary, you can go with seven millimeters, that's fine because it's a softer bone. For mandible, you need to go at least for nine, nine millimeters. And then for maxillary, you might not to give uh, verticals on the border sides, only one side vertical, even without vertical, you might go away because maxillary bone is quite spongy bone, but mandibular you need to give this vertical cuts, this side here, this side, otherwise this plate will fracture, okay? You still have uh, rescue if, you, if it fractures, but I'm not going to that complicate, complicated kind of uh, augmentation in this uh, presentation. So now you can understand that after split, you have been able to increase one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So your reach now becomes eight, eight and a half millimeters. So you can place the implant very well. And then you, uh, if your this one is well stabilized and you find this reach is quite having a volume, you don't need to augment from outside. You can augment only inside. But if this requires even more augmentation, you have to augment it from the outside. So you can see. There are two verticals and your implant is exposed. You need, in this case, we have augmented from outside. Another vertical here. So, so inside we have augmented and we have augmented from outside as well and placed the implant. Now look at this closure. So we have done enough uh, tension. So you can understand there is eversion of the margin because it's so much passive that we have been able to mobilize the flap so much that not only the margins have come closer, margins have overlapped. That's why I was talking about that. Look, the suture has not been given in only here, but we've started from here. So we have given sutures in layers so we can bring down the vestibule a little bit more. No problem. After five months, you will find the mucogenival junction has reshifted to the place, but your job is done. So, but you need to mobilize a lot. So from here, this amount of ridge width we have landed up to this amount after four months okay so you can see how much ridge width we have gone from here to here so much of bone volume uh, you can understand now in the second part stage two when you have opened can you see how much of bone volume we have able to get in only four months with the ridge split the last one of this case is the vertical ridge augmentation because 
we are approaching the time. I have uh, promised uh, Aditi to finish in 45 minutes and more. But this is a case where a previous implant has been placed, which has failed. It's a pre implant at this case. So when you have extracted this implant, you have landed up with a little bit of vertical augmentation. Uh, okay. So in this case, what we have done, we've done a little bit of vertical augmentation. We have lost a little bit of horizontal tissue, but we have done in six weeks. So we have opened up this case. And this case I was talking about, this is amount of vertical augmentation you have to do. You cannot do only vertical augmentation. For sure, you need to build up from horizontal and then put in vertical with a full on. And so we have utilized a little bit of screw and with a mesh, okay? This is a tie mesh. So we have used this, but only risk of using a tie mesh is, you might be knowing that if your tissue is overlying tissue is thin, there is exposure of the tie mesh, okay? Because tie mesh gives some bit of exposure with this time. So we have placed some autogenous bone along with the xenograft. In this case, it's a, it's a bovine graft. Uh, the mixture is 60-40, uh, 60% xenograft with 40% autogenous graft. And we have placed a time mesh here and we have closed, closed this. So after nine months, because it requires time, we have reopened the site. You can see quite a bit of bone formation, not only horizontally, but if you remember the original tissue was heart tissue level was here, we have been able to form it on the Okay. So So you can understand that the amount of tissue we have been able to form, okay? So look at this, originally we had the deficiency up to here. So we have been able to gain this amount of tissue, which is quite good for the vertical augmentation. But uh, there are complex vertical augmentations for the posteriors, but uh, we, we, we don't have time to discuss all this because uh, that's a, another chapter because vertical augmentation is not very predictable. Remember, uh, that's why we, uh, this we want to talk about that vertical GBR is, again, there are very few people in the world who can do very good vertical GBR. This guy is one of them, is Van Arben. And uh, they remain the re results stable for four to five years usually. Uh, before, after that vertical regeneration doesn't have too much of a bone volume. If you see this graph that marginal bone volume change you see that in fifth year, there is a quite a bit of change. So there is a loss of volume around two millimeters. Some of the people I, I told you, they've been able to maintain the volume as urban. That's what you see. How is urban? urban? How much change? Only 1.73 millimeters change. But for most of the other people in three years, four years time, there's a loss of tissue, but still it works. So, we have discussed a little bit about because we had a little bit of waste of time. I've tried to give you an overview of a little bit of bone building techniques every day. Hope that you have enjoyed this. And I want to finish with this that uh, very important thing is do what is right, not what is easy. So it might be because I have told you that you need to follow the past principle. It might be a little bit tedious to uh, give periosteal stripping, mobilizing the flap, placing the Curating the side, placing the bone graft in layers, stabilizing the membrane, then suturing in layers and post-operative cares. Uh, but that's absolutely right. And uh, that's that's not what is easy. Uh, but so you, you need to follow this path. And remember that what mm, make everything simple as Albert Einstein says, uh, as simple as possible, but not simple. Don't make it so much simple that uh, it is not predictable at all. So thank you for uh, your patient listening. And uh, thank you, Aditi, over to you. Thank you so much, sir, for this amazing presentation. Uh, now I request all the participants to kindly drop their questions in the question and answer. Yes. Uh, so that we can start with the question and answer session. 
and before that i'll be introducing our uh, participants to our organization so no longer sharing the screen isn't it uh, so we are sharing the screen okay yeah, yeah. So uh, this is our organization, Dente Channel Online, with the motto Hindi Smiles That Lead to Wealthy Life. And we welcome you to the second virtual World Implant Expo 2021. First, we had last year in 2020, and we are proud to announce that DCO had entered Indian Book of Records for having maximum number of speakers uh, attending and speaking on oral implantology at one platform. So this time, we have more than 40 speakers with us, and all are the stalwarts of implantology. Uh, DCO is a leading dental market, dental digital marketing uh, media company that uh, are striving hard to bring all the dental practitioners and dental companies on one platform and creating opportunities for everyone. And uh, being a prime member, you can uh, subscribe to a lot of benefits. Like you'll be, uh, you'll be getting uh, webinars. Uh, we conduct webinars and uh, workshops every month, and uh, you can subscribe to our prime membership. Uh, the annual membership will cost you this 499 rupees and after that you can avail certificates uh, like uh, this is one sample certificate uh, which you'll be receiving after the end of the work after the end of the implant expo uh, and uh, this is accredited with 30 cpd points so next webinar that uh, we have lined up are uh, at 3 30 we have dr shiva shankar with us on digital implantology on at uh, 5 30 we're having dr olga on prevention and management of peri implantitis at uh, eight o'clock we have dr central with us and uh, and uh, tomorrow in the morning uh, at 10 a.m we have dr sanjay with us I request all the participants to kindly take a screenshot and save this number and send your name as a text message on this number so that you are added to our broadcast list and we'll be updated regarding each and every upcoming events that we have. And we have a sponsor, and our World Implant Expo is sponsored by uh, Mono Implant, Unicorn Dental, Mart, Nova Mine, Bicon, JTK, Shastri Brothers, Implant, and Qualia. Those who have missed out our live sessions, uh, they can go back uh, on our handles on Facebook and uh, YouTube and find our recorded videos there. So I request everyone to uh, follow us on Facebook, Instagram and uh, YouTube using our handle Dentist Channel Online. From, okay. Uh, now, sir, uh, can we move on to the question and answer session, sir? Sir, uh, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah. Okay, so first question is from Dr. Krishna. He's asking how many months we should wait after bone grafting to place an implant ID? Uh, after bone graft means what kind of bone grafting? GBR or rich preservation? That's I'm not very sure. But usually for rich preservation, uh, we do the rich preservation.